All right. So here we are. Today is, oh, I don't know. It's today, Tuesday, December the 8th, 2020. And uh, the Palmetto Group, we're here on the lifeline, uh, learning, inspiring, forming, and engaging uh, the greater community. So today we're just going to have a quick I'm calling it a caps chat, our collaborators and partners. And we're talking this morning about community building. Um, there's a lot to unpack here. So we're gonna do these talks in bite-sized pieces. Uh, today we have Mr. James Davis, Vanessa Lindsay and Barbara Brown with us. You're gonna get to meet each one of them. And um, a little bit about their organizations, but then how we put everything together as a collective in this world of community building. So, la so ladies and gentlemen, um, good morning, first of all, and thank y'all for being here this morning. Good morning. Um, Hey, okay. I know it's is this this virtual meeting is good, but you know you're not there to kind of feel the energy and see the faces, and you don't want to talk over somebody else. But um, but anyway, virtual meetings they have their space, and it's a good thing. Um, <clears throat> can we jump back into the conversation because we really had gotten started um real good here. So we're talking about community building. And one thing I said this morning, uh, before we started recording, I was talking about a quote from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He said, we must learn to live together as brothers or perish together as fools. And so the, the initial thought was, now how do we reconcile that with community building, even in times right now that are a little bit divisive? Um, um, who wants to kind of jump in and, and maybe we can pick back up on our conversation about community building and learning to work together so that we don't all perish. I don't mind going first. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. Okay. I think there's a lot of volunteer organizations and there's a lot of people of goodwill who were inspired by Dr. Martin Luther King and want to engage in positive actions if they feel that it would make a difference. So I think it's a responsibility for us to encourage leadership individuals to create an environment where people feel safe in mm -hmm. expressing love as opposed to being caustic and not nice. Mm, mm. Um, Mr. Dave, um, actually, so we, 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 we're going to put that pin there. I really kind of wanted to go back, Vanessa, before we started recording, you brought up really an excellent point in before we start talking about reconciling anything with community building, how do we define community building? Um, did you wanna start, you know, did you wanna share your takeaway or do you want me to go ahead and read this definition that I actually found? Cause we really started some great conversation going down that road. Okay, yeah, let's read, let's start off with reading the definition and then really define it and then um, Put it in, in putting in the the and then when we can define the definition, where we can get it where the ghosts can get the ghosts can get to a really really where a third grader could understand it because sometimes we use a lot of words and jargon and people are like and we're talking about building the community but we're here and we're in our think tanks and we create all this stuff and the community has no we're not even talking in language they can understand. So and if we're not talking culturally and linguistically to them, we're never going to build the community. So if we can define what that is in or third graders level. Well, I don't know that what I'm going to read to you is a third graders level, but I'm going right. to read to you from right. this. Um, right. It's, it's not. And then maybe we can go back and break it down. Yes. Because, you know, not trying to be so really, really far in the weeds, but I think a lot of this and, and, and where we're having the conversation as practitioners, if you will, this sort of helps us mold how we go into those or uh, those communities and neighborhoods 
where perhaps, yeah, they're not thinking about community building, but there's so much untapped resources and, and wealth of things. So then this is for us as the practitioners. How do we go in and do that? So the definition I have here is community building is strengthening the ability of neighborhood residents, associations, and organizations to work individually and collectively to initiate and sustain positive neighborhood change. Community building is an, is an evolving people focused process. Now, for me, there's there, that's loaded. People focused and process is what kind of sets out for me when we start looking at community building. Because yeah, when we start thinking community building, a lot of times I think we get definitions and things a little muddy. We start thinking about infrastructure, housing, you know, big, all this, these big things. But really the community development or the community building process begins and ends with the individual talents, assets and resources of the people. We have to build on the people. And I say on the assets and the strengths of the people because you can't build on deficits. We, we have to build on what those strengths are. So in a nutshell, from a practitioner standpoint, there is community building, a people-focused process that brings people together, helps them get organized, but then helps them initiate mm -hmm. and sustain what they have said is important to their community. Excellent definition. And I like Vanessa's encouragement that we make it a simple definition that a third grader could understand. And I would piggyback on that and say, make community building a definition that a third grader could participate in, in terms of mm. a third grader engaged in community building. And for me, I think about when I was in third grade, I was involved in people building activities via my family, via my church, via my school. So when I use the word holistic before, I shouldn't use that work word, I should have used the word um, a process where the kids, the grandparents, the aunts, the uncles, the mom, the dad, the teachers, the minister, it's really a group that's moving forward in the same direction, motivated by love. That would be my third grade attempt to define it. That's building a social infrastructure. Amen. Uh -huh. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. And I like that. And 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 my mind, as you were as you were talking, uh, Mr. Davis, I was like, okay, okay, this is good. As you're breaking it down, it's like because within the community, we have so many different communities. Mm -hmm. And so, do we break? Do do we start with the the nuclear community? Let's get let's get into the families, and then bridge out. Or when we're talking about community building, are we talking about outside going in? Are we talking about inside going out? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't have it close to me, but um, there's a book and Barbara, I'm not sure if, if you are familiar with it. And I want to say it's John McKnight and Jody Kretzman building communities from the inside out. Um, yeah, yeah. So I'm looking around, I don't know where I put it. Cause I know I have some great things highlighted in that book. So and we were talking earlier too, even, you know, in, in church, when we talk about building, growing the church and, you know, either the building or trying to grow numbers. One thing that's clear, if you build the people, and that is a part of that growing the people from the inside out, then the you build the bigger. Um, so I wonder if even as we start looking at community development in this hour, in this season, in this time, if less is more or how shall I say, or smaller is more focusing on the, 
the 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 individual capacity versus big programs and projects i don't know i don't even know if i meant to say that <laughs> i'll respond to that and i if i'm correct it's a story that's in that book or i heard uh someone talk about the story as a response to that book from the community that they were within um a lot of i i came from the knowledge i I come from the knowledge of what went on with McKnight and, and the building from the inside out from two perspectives. One, exploring what they did on their own in sort of an academic way, but also a lot of what they done is integrative to the work that I've done with Kettering Foundation and National Issues Forums Institute. But one of the stories that I was so intrigued with, and I, I, I think of it often is, there was a story of a community was trying to improve and all the things that we think of doing. And there was this very kind older lady who would talk about how she supported their efforts, but there was nothing she felt that she had that she could offer. I don't know what I can do. I don't have much money, whatever, you know, and, but she had beautiful African violets all over her house. And they say, how could you get so many African violets? And she she told the story of, well, how, you know, they die out after a while, but, but she would take a leaf that was still there and she would be able to root it and start a new plant. And so her African violets never completely died out. And she grew mm -hmm. so many of them that she said, you know, I can't keep all of these. What do I do with them? So she would always give a beautiful African violet to anybody in the community that she heard that was ill. Mm. And she just did that out of the love that she had for people and her community. Didn't even consider it a skill. Mm -hmm. Somehow that impressed on me so much that I never let an African violet completely die anymore. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, you may pick several leaves and put them in water to root them and maybe only one of those leaves root. Mm. But then, as soon as they have roots, you put them in the dirt. And right now I have one huge African violet that was rooted that way. It's already bloomed twice. And I have two new African violets that have tiny little leaves coming on them. I never did that before till I was, I mean, I didn't think you could regrow African violets, you know, you couldn't get them to root, you know, but it, it, it's a, it's a life story that it goes back to that word empowerment because there's, there's not a better word in our vocabulary. But sometimes as we work with others, it's our role to help others realize the value of some of the things that they do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In a way that is empowering. You know, the, mm -hmm. con the philosophical concept of you can't give anybody power, mm -hmm. but you can help people identify their strengths, their power. Exactly, exactly. Barbara, that was loaded. And as practitioners, I think that's a good um, thought to keep at the forefront whenever we begin, especially when we begin a new work, is that we go in knowing we don't have the power uh, to give or to do anything. I was looking at some more of my notes from some early NeighborWorks workshops, and it says, uh, you don't expect a good consultant to come in and solve the problem for you. A good consultant asks the right questions that leads you to solve the problem. Because again, any change or development that's going to be sustainable has to come from the inside out inside the person or inside the community. Um, 
that that was actually great. You know, Barbara, I actually um, I tell some of the young people that I that I hang around with a, a good little bit. I tell them, um, if you really love me, I should never die. If I have imparted anything good to you, any bit of wisdom, anything, you need to deposit that in a young in someone younger than you as well. If you really love me, you'll never let me die. Yes. So I want to be like that African violet. Just go on and on and on. The good stuff. Only the good stuff. Just reproduce the good things. <laughs> I don't want to talk over anyone. Um, I just, it's hard. I can't see everybody the way my screen is set up right now. So I don't know if anybody else wanted to chime in there uh, after Barbara's comments. What's the question on the table right now? You know, I just didn't know if anyone wanted to chime in after um, Barbara's comments, because it was very loaded. I love that African violet story. Mm -hmm. But I heard something else in there as well. We really haven't brought this out. Um, but even as we think about so developing, developing the individual so that their contribution to the whole is um is quite valuable how do we begin to look at look, no i tell you what because i was looking at something else when we talk about values shaping and and community coming together around common values and building from there you know how do we begin to <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to say shape values but how do we begin to figure out what are the common values cuz I think sometimes we go too fast to the shaping of the values but when we have a community coming together how do we begin to identify what that community holds as valuable how how do we begin to identify community values um could I jump in and mm -hmm. I'll, I'll piggyback a little bit off of Barbara. She brought up the beautiful example about the violence and, and the lady sharing the violence. Dr. Martin Luther King, his last speech was called the drum leader. Mm -hmm. And in that speech, he says, if you wanna be a leader, be of service. To me, it's, it's one of his most powerful speeches and I think that a way to shape values, to answer your question, Cynthia, is to get third graders and their parents and their teachers to engage in community service programs, service at their church, service at their school. When you're helping somebody else, there's a physiological chemical explosion that goes off in your brain. Mm -hmm. And basically being of service also has a spiritual component. It's pretty much impossible to be of service, be loving and care about others and be divisive. So I think that is a way to engage in an activity that can shape values that everybody can in, be involved in, that third grader and that third grader's grandparent or foster parent. And I think Dr. King in that speech gave us some actual can-do activities that are actionable and they're pragmatic. So, <clears throat> Here's something I heard in there. Back to the definition that we started with community building. People focus because we're giving of service, but then there are some that are receiving of the service so that people focus relationship and then process. Um, and there needs to be dialogue for that process. Ah, self-dialogue, dialogue between the givers and the receivers, uh, even observers, possibly. It, 
part of what I was thinking of when when you first talked about that, Mr. Davis, was, you know, I, I relate to what I learned to our experiences and my experiences. There was a time that our, our South Carolina Department of Education was giving a lot of service learning grants. And one of the steps for doing whatever the service was, it, they didn't look at it as you doing the job they gave you the money to do if you couldn't explain what was the dialogue process afterwards that helped people synthesize what they did. What did they learn? Who benefited? How did you feel when you did it? And, and that, was a, that was an absolute step that was part of the formal model for service learning. Hmm. And, and, you know, it's a simple process and it was mostly designed for school kids, but it applies to so many of us. Cause sometimes like we'll do some things and it's so good or we'll see others doing things and it's so good, but it's not processed. And in the context, way back to what you said initially, Cynthia, how do we get to where we need to be, essentially, because there's such divide? Is the process of, a, of, of synthesizing that value, the mm. value that we see occurring. It's almost like you got to pull it out and identify it. So that third grade, what is that I saw? Mm -hmm. What is that I feel? How do I do that in another way? And we depend on our words to take that to the community, to build the community. Otherwise, we may, we may process it ourselves, but it's just within. That's mm -hmm. not good enough. And it's not good enough. Mm-hmm. Because I'm hearing values First of all, identifying values, then values sharing, and then value shaping. And, and I did them in that order, but whatever the, but those components are mixed. The, so built in, in building the community, in building community, <clears throat> values identifying, but that values shaping is gonna come through value sharing. And how do we share unless we are in relationship through dialogue, service learning projects, how we come together. That's interesting in this work I've done for about 20 years. I didn't, I don't, I don't know that I purposely kind of started some of these observations, but I, you know, I was going away to some of the neighbor works and NUSA trainings and that type thing. Then as I, I come back and I'm in the neighborhood meetings and you know different functions, I, I would just see things, maybe responses, attitudes, just different things that we had just talked about at a conference or a workshop from people who were, of course, you know, much smarter and I much further into the work. And so um, what I, I learned was after a little bit. <laughs> if there was a new, a new project or something we needed to do, I could offer input as to who were maybe some good community people to peg for various things. And I used to say, I could tell you who's gonna come, who's gonna come with an attitude, who's gonna come with a good attitude, who's gonna come and bring someone else, who's gonna come and move boxes, who's gonna come and sit in a chair, <laughs> and who's not gonna come. But it was because working through processes, even attending meetings, having different conversations on different things, I began to see what some others value. It didn't mean that what they valued was more or less than anyone else. It just meant there were different values, different levels of importance on different things. And then that's how we learn who may be a good fit for a particular project. As I think that's one thing that hurts us when it comes to community development and, and doing this work. All things don't fit all people. 
And just because someone doesn't participate with this one thing, it doesn't mean that they may not be excellent for something else. We have to let those, those values and those gifts settle where they belong and not where we think they should be. Synthesizing value. Hmm. Wow. Hmm. Okay. So I heard something else in that too, this process. That is a process as well. Um, so then one challenge, because this is a, a challenge that I have seen. How do we engage our community enough to stay connected during a process? Because that's one thing, that is a challenge that I see. Sometimes, you know, we'll come to the table when something is big or there's a big response to something, but we don't stay engaged through the process. And you, and again, you can't build on a deficit. You can't build on who's not there or what's not there. I don't know if any of you have any thoughts on how to keep the community engaged through an actual process, an entire process. I think um, one of the things that first that needs to be do what need, needs to be done is the community needs to have ownership in their community, and it may be just small as that one family who says, "I have ownership in here." So it's going to have to start there, because we know we'll show up because it's our job. We might not even live uh, inside that community, but we'll show up. It's our job. But if we can empower a few people in that community and work with them and stick with them and show them. And then they will be the, hopefully, they will be the ones that will spearhead it and be the glue that will keep all of us together because they're so invested and the, they have ownership. It's theirs. But right now, a lot of people in these communities, they have no ownership in these communities. They just live mm -hmm. there. There's no ownership. Mm -hmm. So how do you, how do we, how do they feel ownership in something that's really not even tangible to them? It's not theirs. Exactly. That's a good point. Um, because sometimes as practitioners, I do see that we go in with a plan or, you know, whatever we're tasked to do. And sometimes that plan is far removed from what the people in that community yeah. really see as important. Um, you know, again, Barbara, I, I, I love that African violet and I'm thinking now I'm going to try and grow some, but I can't be concerned about growing, you know, starting a garden and growing African violets if, you know, shots are ringing out in my neighborhood all night and I got to decide if I'm going to sleep in the bed or sleep in the tub. So really growing African violets, you, 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 I, although it's wonderful because that's now what, again, I think I'm going to try and get some. Um, could, could I answer that? We, yes, okay. yes. Yeah. Okay, so that's a good point that Vanessa brought up. How do we keep people engaged? And I would mm -hmm. admit that if we're conscious about community building, building is a verb, it's not a noun. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And if people are part of building something and if building a peaceful community is a goal, mm -hmm. then doing something about the violence in the community it's an obligation, it's not an option. Mm. And that could be as much as calling somebody. If you see something that's wrong, you call somebody. And if you don't want to call the police, call the, the person in the community that has a relationship with the watch commander. Mm -hmm. I, I think community building is a, is a verb. And I mm -hmm. also, I don't think it's very sophisticated. Granted, mm -hmm. dialogue is needed, mm -hmm. but other than that, the African violets growing, you know, growing vegetables and, and getting those vegetables to, to Granny May or, or, you know, there, there's a lot of easy community engagement activities that are part of a building consciousness. Mm -hmm. This this is what we're doing right now. We're, we're exactly. building community by taking away investing some time and brainstorming and, and thinking about how we can plant some seeds that other folks will grow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I, 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 I might ahead. add to that, in that process, 
there's the sort of awareness and a commitment to flexibility because we can approach a community building effort with a big goal, even a plan in mind. But what happens in the interim is smaller relationships that evolve among those people in the neighborhood. And as those are acted on, that helps synthesize those values and get to the place that Mr. Davis is talking about. You have to be responsive. And you said something about that, Cynthia, at the beginning. As an individual, you have to be responsive to the need, to the interest that you hear almost at the moment. Mm -hmm. And in many, many cases, that smaller absolute need and an action to respond to it can work towards that bigger community mm -hmm. building. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm a storyteller and I, I, I sort of apologize for that because it takes time. But Don't. I communicate. <laughs> my son died in December, my 45 year old son died in December of 18. I've always liked our neighborhood. We're on a, on a cul-de-sac and the neighbors always wave at each other, but you know, we all have busy lives and we don't see much of each other, but I felt comfortable with my neighborhood. Um, I liked my house, but I, I, I I've lived here the longest than I've lived anywhere. And I never really felt like Sumter was home. Uh, we were military, we moved around a lot. My son died in December and all of the neighbors on my street in one way or the other, they didn't plan it. People do what they can do to respond to a need. But it's like they had all gotten together and planned what they could do to help one individual family's need. And they did what they could do as individuals. The result for that, for me, for my family, is a brand new feeling of, yes, this is my home. My wow. next door neighbor was the preacher at the funeral. The neighbor across the street, I could say what she did. And each of the neighbors did something different that stood out as a representative of their family. It built our community. And then that wasn't a one-time happening. The awareness of, everybody was aware of how their individual deeds supported us so much. And so that, that was multiplied since then when the others had needs. Mm -hmm. It was always somewhat there, but this was sort of a, you know, it wasn't expected. It was something out of the norm. And so everybody was sort of around it at one time. But I think you can apply that. You know, sometimes we don't act because we think, well, there's not much I could do. What would it, how could it help? But it does help. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm hearing again process. And Barbara, I heard in what you just said, something as simple as driving down the street and waving at your neighbor. A part of that process of building the relationship. And then I heard in this trust. Um, what is that trust level too in the community? Um, I trust you, um, you know, not to run over my cat or I trust you, you know, to be there in a time of need or simply, I just trust you simply not to hurt me, but building that trust can be just something as simple as we don't talk every day, but there is a, a kindness towards each other. Um, 
and I'm back to obligation versus option too, Mr. Davis. I heard in there. Um, now that's interesting. So listening to Barbara's story, obligation versus option. You know, I can even, what are my obligations as a neighbor in a community? Um, one Dr. of my story, yes, sir. Dr. Clay, Dr. King laid it out, live together as brothers or die but, together as, as fools. Yeah, um, but I was going in, in my neighborhood, which I live in the country and it's just basically mother on one side and open field on the other, but you know, when I look at my obligation versus option, I would used to tell people some years ago, you know, mother would be home all day and she cut her grass and do her flowers and, you know, and then I pull in the yard and I'm looking at her neatly mowed yard and my grass basically up to my knees. <laughs> and, you know, so I really wasn't a good neighbor. Um, I don't think I fulfilled my obligation well to neighborhood or community beautification. Um, I saw it, I think then as an option, but it's like the older I get, I, I do. I, 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 and I would tell people when I pull in the yard and mother's yard is cut and the flowers are pretty and my grass is up to my knees, I would feel the obligation to get out there, get the lawn and cut my grass because her value, her, and, and so her values actually began to help shape mine. And so we need to look at um, what are our values and then how we share those, how they help shape a community. And then what are our obligations? I, I, I feel like we are obligated. Um, now, maybe I shouldn't have said it like that because that does come off very personal and direct, but I do, we're obligated to leave a place better than we found it. And so I do, I, we're obligated to contribute to the whole good. Um, that yes. speaks too to how visibility is also talking. Hmm. Your mother did, hmm. she may have, but your mother, you know, in your story, your mother didn't get on your back for not cutting your weeds. <laughs> but she spoke loudly Mm -hmm. through the example that she set mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that is and that really gets back to the story I said you know I always thought I was in a good neighborhood because we all waved at each other that was mm -hmm. a visibility of initiating that feeling of community and that an area of trust and that was that was you know there wasn't a whole lot there beyond that there was the busy lives mm -hmm. But when there was a need, it, it spoke to how much more was there as a community. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In, in the actions they, they demonstrated, it built the community even more because mm -hmm. there was more interactions with all of those families. It's been two years now and there's more interactions with all those those neighborhood people than there weren't mm -hmm. anymore than there weren't were before so we can't overlook the importance and the value of community organizations neighborhood associations uh neighborhood block groups community flower groups we can't overlook the value of those because again instead of going to your neighbor's house and, you know, bamming on the door and telling them how awful they are because their grass is up to their knees. We can demonstrate just by simply acting out um, our values, living out our values, quite simply. Wow. Well, I, I don't know, I don't want to cut anyone off, but I don't want to um, go very long because I really do want us to have, a, one reason I want to do these is because individually, I have the best conversations with each of you. There are so many times I wish I could have recorded just some, as we're just going, 
And I believe this is a part of our gift to the community. Uh, we each have experience. I, I don't want to start tallying the years among us. We probably have well over, honestly, a century of experience, a wealth of knowledge. And um, I, for one, uh, have no intention of leaving this earth with all this stuff in me. I, I, I was put here um, to make some deposits. And that's what I intend to do. So I thank each of you for sharing in this. So I want us to have uh, some, some small chats and then talk about some of the projects that we're doing uh, individually and collectively and what we are contributing uh, to community as well. As I said at the beginning, my goal with the Palmetto Group and, and things that are going on here is to discover, develop, and deploy social capital by using asset-based community development principles and best practices. What's, how, do, how can we do this? There are, uh, I believe there are principles for op operation. Um, and we talk about obligation versus option because I told someone the other day, you know, sometimes we do things based on who we like or I like this person, I like the way they do that. Bunk. We are commanded to love. We're not commanded to lie. I, we, I like lump, that's not even the issue. There are some obligations and a, a attachments to love. And so a part of um, what I want to do again is fulfill the obligation, you know, that we individually have to contribute to the greater whole. And that is to help discover, develop, and deploy those hidden assets in people and communities that's just lying there waiting for us to use to make this world a better place, doggone it. Okay, so again, I don't want to cut anyone off. I have taken some, um, I've gotten some little nuggets here, synthesizing value, um, obligation versus option, you know, this trust, building trust, the process, um, we need to look at some community service learning programs um, that we can help facilitate, that we can help bring values to life. So I really want to look at that, hopefully in the very near future. And this African violet story, I want, I've got to start growing some African violets. So I've got some takeaways from today. And um, again, I thank y'all. Does anyone else, I don't want to cut anyone off, but um I don't know if anyone wants to have a final comment or a final thought, and we will sign off. I thought this discussion was very constructive, um, creative, and thoughtful. I've, I've benefited from it. Thank you. I, I concur. It's very thought provoking, and, and, it's, and it's nice just to take a step back and just really to be able to just process and think you know, outside of our normal every day to day and to be able to push the envelope a little bit. So thank you. Thank you for this. Yes, thank all of you. And thank you, Cynthia, for convening us. Well, what I'm going to do, if you all don't mind, I will put the link to everyone's organization in the comments and um, so that people can find you, find the work that you're doing and reach out to you directly if there's something that they need. Um, I think I have all of you listed on our website. It is www.thepalmettogroupces.site. And the CES is Community Engagement Specialist. So you can go to that website and you can find links to all of these wonderful, brilliant minds <laughs> that we're talking with today. All right. Thank you all. And we'll chat. Later. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.